So let's have a first look, a general overview of the Sicily Rome. The Sicily Rome American Cemetery. We have a surface of 77 acres, and we've been existing for 76 years right now. Okay, so we're gonna start soon with some, some more details about the facility. Let me just tell you a few things about the name behind the facility, which is obviously Sicily Rome, because we have the remains of those who died in the very first part of the campaign of Italy. That is to say, from the very first landing down in Sicily, July 1943, till the liberation of Rome, June 44. That's why our name is Sicily Rome. We are one of the two U.S. military cemetery in Italy, cemeteries in Italy. The second one is in Florence. So those who died after the liberation of Rome are buried in Florence. Those who died between that first landing I was telling you earlier on and the liberation of Rome are buried here, okay? So a bit of history about the facility. As I said, we've been existing for 76 years and the Anzio landing took place January 22nd, 1944, which is the last amphibious assault performed by the US forces here in Italy. And two days later, unfortunately, there was already the need to find a burial site. So two days after, 48 hours after the landing, the operations were starting to get really hard and the US forces needed a suitable spot were to start burning service members who were starting to die with the carry out of the, of the operation, of the war operation. Uh, back then in Italy, in war years, in war days, there were nearly 20 cemetery, temporary cemeteries around the whole boot and Sicily Island. So we're here today. We are 50 kilometers south of Rome. We are on the, sh on the shoreline. Anzio and Nettuno are twin cities right now, and, uh, and the landing was performed in the Bay of Anzio. Whatever you see here, all over, back in the days was actually countryside. Right now we are downtown, and the US forces decided that this could be a suitable spot where to start installing a temporary center. So, if we stay temporary, we, we were temporary between 44, and 56, and in 1956, ADMC, American Battle Monuments Commission, which is the smallest commission of the US government, which administrates all overseas US military cemeteries, decided that this was going to be a permanent cemetery, okay? So, between 44 and nine, between 1944 and 1956, American Battle Monuments Commission got in touch with the families of the beautiful people buried here, to let them have the final decision whether having them back in the United States on the US government coast or bury them abroad. Those you see here, except the 488 unknown soldiers, are buried here because of the desire of the family. So they did have the chance to bring them back in the United States. If you see them here, it's because the family deliberately decided to leave them here. Okay, we're gonna be silent for a few seconds. We're gonna have Eduardo filling a bit of the overview. And we're gonna start walking towards the memorial, which is the last step of our walk today, okay? So, do you have any questions so far? So, um, what year did they actually dedicate the cemetery? Well, in 1956. And um, did Eisenhower or have any presidents been to the cemetery? Uh, it, Eisenhower dedicated the cemetery here. He was not here, but the, uh, the president coming here in the years were Bush Senior and Clinton. In 19, Bush senior in 89 and uh, Clinton in 94, 1994 for the 50th anniversary of the Ancient Landing. 
And um, in a normal year, what would okay. you do for Veterans Day? In, in a normal year, we host a concert. We have a local uh, musical school, a high school, and we give them the chance to perform a concert. We have a very narrow link with the local community. Memorial Day is really participated by the local community. We may have 3,000 people that day. Watch out. And another, also another important ceremony here is, this, is the anniversary of the Ansel landing, January 22nd. Every year, we usually have the official ceremony in the morning and then some other events in the, um, in the currents of the day. Any, question? Any other question? Um, how many visitors do you usually have every year in the cemetery on a normal year? Uh, we calculated anything between 150,000 and 200,000. That's the average. It's a, it's a massive number. Do you still have many American relatives, families? That's a very good question. We have an average every year of 100 family members coming. And I'm not counting the quantity of people who comes, but I'm actually counting the quantity of service members we go and pay homage to. Because sometimes we have six family members, sometimes there's just one single service uh, family member. We count the average uh, the heads and we go and visit, and that number is anything between 100 and 120. And if you think that 76 years have passed, that's still a massive number. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you now, actually, for the audience. Why do you think families decided to leave their beloved one here on the other corner of the world? Do you have any idea? No clue? <laughs> well, I, I've, I've uh, read many stories and I've been to um, the monument in, uh, in Normandy, which okay. is massive. And even though ceremonies are very, um, every year there, there are so many veterans who are still able to travel who travel. I think the families think they have a connection to that place. And if they didn't have children or um, a wife, maybe they thought that that was the best place to leave them. Yeah, that's pretty much the average answer. Um, some other answers we heard in the past are, for instance, this, is, this place is full of dignity and here there will always be someone taking care of the burial mm -hmm. in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. So no matter how long the family was going to leave, to, sort of, to leave their below, the lost beloved ones, here forever there will be someone taking care of the burial. Because when they got the, the, the telegram from American Battle Monuments Commission, the repatriation of the remains was on the U.S. government. So was, no one decided to leave them here because they could not afford it. It was not such a problem. Um, many people decided to leave them here because, for instance, President uh, Roosevelt lost two children in the um, two sons in the in the um, Normandy landing and, and following the operations of the Normandy landing. So they were buried into an in an avian sea cemetery. So many people thought if Roosevelt is having their son buried in an ABMC cemetery, I can have the same treatment of such a man. So I'm going to go ahead and decide to leave my son or my daughter in, a, in an ABMC cemetery. Mm -hmm. um, some people, some service members were alone in the world. They were probably orphans. No one could take that decision. Another answer we got for instance, is uh, many widows had got married again. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about a society of the middle 40s, early 50s, because it was not that they died in 1944 and simultaneously the family was informed or the, or the widow was informed. It could take years mm -hmm. to receive that letter. So 
when you don't see your belonged one coming back home in three years, you make your, you, you already know what happened. Right. So many widows got married again. And back in the days, in those years, it was really, really hard to be a single, man, uh, single woman, for instance, with children possibly. And also was really uh, embarrassing to, to, to have an example to have the remains of our beloved one back in the States. So we, we also heard about this kind of explanation. And then, since we are in Italy, I'm gonna actually tell you that a lot of families decided to leave the beloved one here because of their Italian American origins. We have a massive number of service members whose, whose last name is an Italian last name. We are not able to calculate the exact proportion of Italian American here because we may, I mean, we're able to actually cal calculate that figure only if we read an Italian last name. But what if the mother was Italian? Right. So they could be 100% of them basically, okay? Now we're gonna actually go and meet, I'm gonna see uh, an Edston from a very short distance so that you actually realize how an Edston is engraved, how they're located, and many other important details. And we're gonna speak about Italian Americans, okay? Okay. Any, any new questions so far? Um, I read that you have also 23 uh, sets of brothers buried there. We actually have 30 sets of 30. brothers, and three of them were actually twins, okay? Oh. So, we're gonna go in, uh, we are in plot G right now, which is the second to last on the, on the left side of the cemetery. We're going to gray, row 15, gray 38. To let you have an idea where we are right now. We started our conversation here by the pond and we moved all the way up to the left side and we are in flow G right now, okay? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna go to row 15, grade 38. And going back to your question, we have 30 sets of brothers. Three of them were actually twins. And brothers are buried together, close to each other. Many people ask us if there's any criterion of the burial. Everyone is actually buried close to each other, no matter what was their ranking in the military service. I have a clear example here. This service member here was a first lieutenant, which means that he was an, um, being in the service was his career. Close to him, you have private first class, someone who enlisted, probably drafted or volunteered. Mm -hmm. There's no specific criterion in the burials of all the agency cemeteries, okay? Brothers are buried together, and the crew members of the same flights that crashed are buried together. That's it. You may have a brigadier general close to a private. There's no distinction at all. And brothers, again, are buried together. Let's go and see a clear example of an Italian-American. So we have Mr. Pasquale Ruggia who was a, a private. He was born in Italy. And when he was three, he was born in 1950, uh, 1925. And when he was three, 1928, his family decided to emigrate to the United States. We were able to actually date back the, um, the moment his family emigrated because we were able to find on the internet the passenger list Oh. passenger manifest 
of the SS Roma, which was the ship, which is this kind of ship, wow. that left Naples on a day of 1928 and docked in New York. So we are talking about a clear example of an Italian family emigrating to the United States, okay? Mm -hmm. So Pasquale was born in Italy, in the Naples area. At the age of three, he joins the family, of course, to go to the United States. And at the age of 18, he actually joins the service, prob probably to get the US citizenship. That was one of the main steps to be able to tell, to, to be able to, to claim the US citizenship, okay? He was sent, obviously, to Italy because of the language. That was part of the strategy. That's why we have a lot of Italian Americans here because part of the strategy of the US forces was to send Italian Americans to Italy so that they could have a narrow connection with the local communities. And this is what happened also around here, okay? Mm -hmm. So, Pasquale Uggia, unfortunately died December 28, 1943 in the Gustav Line. So the Gustav Line was a line splitting Italy into two halves, okay? Let me tell you a bit of history. Uh, the first landing was in Sicily, July 10th, 1943. In a matter of a few months, they were able to actually go up uh, on the boot, but they stopped eventually mid-November 1943 by the Gustav Line. We're gonna see later on that one pretty better at the map room. Mm -hmm. So the Gustav line was one of the toughest line, the Germans, the defensive toughest line, the Germans had built all, all over the boot of Italy. And the whole operation of the Ansel landing was actually performed to overtake that line. But that would happen only on January 22nd, 1944. So between mid-November and mid-January 1944, uh, the battles were very, very tough. And unfortunately, Pasquale lost his life on, in a town called San Pietro in Fine, which was literally destroyed by the war. It's halfway between Rome and Naples to, to help you locate where this town is. And after the war, the citizens of San Pietro in Fine decided to leave the old town as it was, which means basically is whipped away, destroyed, and go in the valley and build a new town, okay? And this San Pietro in Fine was actually uh, the set for many movies about the war back in the years, okay? So we're talking here about someone who was born in Italy and moved to the United States together with his family, okay? So this is a clear example of someone who's fully Italian American. We're gonna go now on the on the plot on plot I, which is the plot we see over there, which is the last plot on the left side of the Sicily Rome. And we're gonna see some, a bit of difference between Pasquale Ruggia and Henry Ferrari, which is the ad star I'm gonna take you now. Uh, Pasquale was born in Italy and at the age of three emigrated to the United States with his family and probably joined the service to get the citizenship. Henry Ferrari was born in the United States by an Italian family. So, which means that the family had already moved to the United States before Henry was even born, okay? Um, do you have any questions so far? Um, the, the gardens are beautiful, um, first Thank of all. You. That's the first thing that I can, that, 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 that apart from the, the crosses and everything, Okay. Uh, you guys do a lot of genealogical research there. Oh yeah, indeed. And we spend a lot of hours for research and guess what? We are able to actually track down the life of probably not even 10% of them. And we started in 2014. Oh. And um, what, what do you use to do your research? Uh, we use uh, several sources, Ancestry.com, for instance, um, genealogical websites, which allows you to date back the the the, um, the way of the family, mm -hmm. but also we use several websites about divisions and companies and units of the war, mm -hmm. and then 
and one of possibly one the, um, the most precious source of information are the families. Mm -hmm. As I said earlier on, we still today have 100 visits, 100, 120 visits every year in a normal year. And they do have a lot of material sometimes, a picture of the service member, letters from the front. So we build up all that material and then we are eventually able to actually make up a story. So you have a file on every grave? On Not every on every grave, actually we have even between five and 10% of the graves. Okay. Yeah, and do you, I would say six or 7%. Are there still any veterans alive that come to this? Uh, a few of them. In the 90s. Uh, the, the, the youngest who took part to the landing might have been 17. So he's now like 93 or 94. Mm -hmm. okay. So as we go by, as the years pass by, we have least and least veterans. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Um, how many gardeners do you have working there to maintain this? We have 20 gardeners. Three. We always say that ABMC has a um, threefold mission, equally important. Keep the grass green, the heads and white, and the memory alive. I'm the one in charge of the memory. All right. <laughs> okay. okay. Let's go to plot I. If you have any question, just raise your hand, I would say, and just fire off your question, please. Uh, someone, Maria writes, how big is the cemetery? 77 acres, 31 hectare. Okay. Yeah. So you get a lot of exercise there. Oh yeah, indeed. We're, we're never bored. Okay, so now we're going to see the headstone of Henry Ferrari, which is plot I, row nine, grave 32. Let me tell you how we locate every single headstone. So you come here, and on every headstone on the bottom, you see a number, okay? That's number 32, row one, but that's just a number for us to quickly locate every single burial. Imagine the family member, family members of Harry Lynn Melton shows up in a normal year and checks in at the visitor center. And they would go to me like, I am the grandchildren or great grandchildren or great grandchild of Lynn Melton. I'm gonna go in the database, type the, the last name and in, instantly find out that Lynn Melton is buried in Plori, row one, grade 32, okay? This time we're going to row nine, which is a bit further up, okay? Let's go. So we here, Plori row nine, grade 32, and um, the curious thing about this burial is that we have Henry Ferrari, so an American name with um, an Italian last name. And then close to him, we have the same story, Dominic Galliano, okay? So we, we saw earlier on Pasquale Ruggia, which was clearly born in Italy, raised till the age of three in Italy, and then moved to the United States. These two beautiful members, service members, were born in the United States and then deployed to Italy for the same reasons of Pasquale. They could speak the language and that was a very quick move that would allow them to actually quick relation to the, to the local community, okay? Uh, Henry Ferrari was part of the Parachute Infantry Division, the 82nd Airborne Division, which was one of the most involved division all over this area. They also took part to the Normandy landing. 
And Henry Ferrari was acting as interpreter. And he's the clear example of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, because he took part from the very beginning of the campaign of Italy to the, to the very first landing, which was in Sicily, and to the second one, which was uh, deployed September the 9th, 1943, in Salerno, okay? He takes part also to the third one. We don't have a picture of him, but we do have a picture of the minute he was actually injured to death. So this area you see here, the coastline you see here is the coastline a few kilometers south of Netuno. And these were the landing crafts at X-Ray Beach, with, which was the name, the code name of Netuno Beach. And this was the, the dawn. It was probably six or seven in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning. And Henry Ferrari was on this last ship you see here. And unfortunately, that ship got actually bombed by a German craft aircraft. And he died eight, years, eight, um, eight days later for the consequences of the bombing, okay? I'm sorry I can't show a picture of him, but we were not able to actually go on the internet and find the picture of him which is something that actually happened with Pasquale Ruggia, the headstone we saw earlier on. And this was sent by the family. So this was Pasquale Ruggia, a service member we met before. Mm -hmm. Concern, look how smiling and how happy to, to, to wear a uniform he was. So, in this case, in the case of Henry Ferrari, we were only able to actually go and, and find the circumstances of the death. I'm gonna show you that picture again because that was quite impressive. All right, so before we move to the, the memorial, which is the the building you see on the back over there, a beautiful white building. I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna show you a few details more about this beautiful facility. Uh, we have nearly 8,000 headstones. The majority of them are Latin crosses, Christian crosses. We also have 122 stars of David. And then another example of burial is the unknown soldier. So we have 488 cases of unknown soldiers as technology evolves. Hopefully one day we will be able to provide them with their final, with their actual identity. When you, whenever you step into an unknown soldier, it means that the remains were found, but they probably lost the dog tag. And unfortunately, identification was not possible because of that. And we have, four, as I said, 488 unknown soldiers, but we hope that in the future, the family will claim their identity because as, as I was saying earlier on, as technology evolves, we may be able to pair their DNA with the remains, okay? So let's move to the memorial. Do you have any question? Um, I wondered where the headstones are made. Are they made in the uh, US? Are... This is a marble coming from Lhasa, which is a town in the north of Italy, around Trentino Alto Adige. Lhasa is spelled L-A-S-A. -A. And uh, the feature of this marble is that it stays white, much more white than Carrara marble. That's why ABC selected this marble. 
And the marble you see here for the headstones is the marble used for every AMC cemetery oh. all over. Yeah. Oh, even in Arlington, they have marble from Laszlo. Laszlo. Um, actually, Arlington is not managed by ABMC. Oh. Arlington is managed by Department of Defense. Oh. That's the only difference. So in Normandy, they have the same marble. Correct, yeah. Oh. And I, I read that there are also several women buried in the Yes, we have 16 women buried, which means that in the, in the war years, they were not just, a lot of people tend to think that they were nurses. Back in the 40s, in the United States, women could enlist or could be, uh, they could volunteer. And they were active duty. We have two or three of them who were actually nurses, part of the American Red Cross. The rest of them were actually first lieutenant, second lieutenant, belonging to Army Air Force. Okay? Let's go, Edu. You also have some TV airmen. So we are here in front of the statue of the Brother in Arms and it's one of our main symbols here and has a very, two very strong meanings. First meaning is an homage to the 30 sets of brothers who were buried here, as we said earlier on, and three of them were actually twins. And the second meaning is uh, an homage to the brotherhood between Army Army Air Force and Navy. And that brotherhood between those departments were, was essential for the final victory, okay? Uh, I'm talking about three departments, but you see two fellows because back then, Army and Army Air Force were just one department. They split later on, okay? Uh, the, at least they split after this stage was sculpted. The person on the left is Army, and Air Force, of course. And the person on the right is Navy. So the main difference that tells us who's who is the shape of the dog tag. And then some other minor details are the belt, the haircut, I don't know if you can spot that, and then the eight. The one on the right is slightly taller than the one on the left. But again, the main difference is the shape of the, of the dog tread, okay? Uh, you see a wreath laid over there because we had, um, we wanted to every single year on Veterans Day, last November the 11th, we always lay a wreath. And if this was a normal year, you would see plenty of wreath right now. That's just our wreath over there, okay? So we're gonna move to the map room. And before we actually go into the explanation of paintings, I want you to see the beautiful North Carolina What you draw out of the phone? So this is what we call the North Garden. I think it's beautiful. And it's part of the, of the decoration of this beautiful facility. Instead of leaving the pines, ABC decided to actually build this beautiful garden over here, okay? We're gonna go closer and have a look to the colors of the flowers. And a general overview of the gardens. Edo, fai un giro intorno okay. con un po' di zoom sulla, sui fiori. E non so se posso zoomare. Eh? Non si può zoomare, mi sa. 
no, no, zoom nel senso di dire di proprio. Ok, ok. Okay, so you see how beautiful it is? Beautiful. Yeah, indeed. You have to think that a lot of people, since we are downtown, a lot of locals enjoy this place as if it was a park. They okay. still, of course, understand the respect they have to carry out when they're here. But you're gonna see so on a normal year, in such a beautiful day, you would see a lot of people coming here and enjoy the silence of this beautiful place. When they need a moment of them all for themselves, they will come here and just be sitting on the benches, either here or all over the facility. And locals, especially the old generation, is in love with this place. They will never misrespect any single people of this place. So we're gonna see a bit of the paintings over here. This is the map. And it's got the, the painting, actually the operation is blown up over the walls, the very first one is the Sicily one, July 10th, 1943. The second one, this one here, the Salerno Daniel, September the 9th, 1943, and then eventually the Ansel Landing, which is on the other side, we're going to see soon, okay? Before we move to the Ansel Landing painting, let me show you things closer from, from these paintings over here. So the Gustav line I was telling you about earlier on is this line over here. So the US forces were able to actually reach that line mid-November 1943, which means that between July 43 and 1943 and November 1943, Four months, in those four months, they were able to set half of Italy free. Whatever goes between, from Sicily up to that line, which is roughly where I have my book of right now, everything was set free. It was under control of the US for an allied forces, okay? It took them another year and a half to set the rest of Italy free. So this is just to give you an idea of how strong and how tough was the battle for the liberation of Rome and the north of Italy. Let's move to the painting of the Anzuelli. The Gustav line I was telling you earlier on in, on this painting here is this brown line splitting Italy into two half. On this painting here, the south of Italy is that direction and the center and the north of Italy is that direction. We are here today. And Rome is over there. So the distance between Anzio and Rome is 50 kilometers, but it took them nearly six months to fill that gap, okay? Uh, as I said, the, the answer ending was a strategy to overtake the Gustav line 
just to let you have an idea of what happened here all of a sudden january 22nd 1944 answer the tour were slightly more than two fishermen villages back then all of a sudden two o'clock in the morning january 22nd 1944 100,000 service members shows up here okay this is to give you the proportion of what happened so they landed here pretty smoothly without a lot, of, a lot of resistance by the german forces they're able to actually lock the beach territory in the very first weeks but then unfortunately the german counterattack starts on february the first around february the first and that counterattack will go ahead till the very first day, days of June. And eventually on June the 4th, Rome will be liberated. So the US forces were here in this region for nearly six months. And again, going again to the connection between Italy and the United States, here as locals, on top of democracy and freedom, we also have another legacy, which is a day per day legacy, and I think it's beautiful, and you're gonna love this. Nettuno still today is known as oh. City of Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> so, even if war is awful, so that the service member did have some spare time, and that's what they did. So, as I said, from the very first day of the Anster landing, the locals uh, mingled with, uh, with the U.S. forces, and baseball still today is a result of that, of that connection, of that narrow connection. And Netuno is possibly one of the strongest teams in you all over Europe, not only in Italy. <laughs> okay? okay? Let's move to the chapel with the wall of the missing. you have any questions so far? Whenever you have a question, just oh, I have a question sure. from Suzanne. She asks, who designed the garden and did the design have some particular meaning? Um, actually, the, the meaning is basically a sort of trompe l'oeil, is a French word used in architecture. As I was saying earlier on, it was to avoid the, um, the persistence of the pine wood. Rather than have a pine wood in that specific sector, they decided to build a garden. And um, the designer is the team of architects who originally built the cemetery back in the early 50s. What was on this property before the war? Uh, just farmland. It was, nowadays we are downtown, but back then it was farmland. So this is the chapel with the wall of the missing and is another beautiful environment we have here at Sicily Rome. And the names you see engraved all over are the names of 3,095 service members whose body unfortunately was never found. So, we have nearly 8,000 service members buried underneath a cross or a star of David, and then we have 3,095 names memorialized. When I have school kids here, I always tell them, this facility should be one third larger, but that was not possible. You see nearly 8,000 um, headstones, 3,095 
you're not able to see them because they, their bodies, unfortunately, were never found. So in these cases, the tragedy is even deeper, okay? Because they were never found. So the total number of enhancements plus the total number of service members memorialized here makes nearly 11,000 service members permanently commemorated here at Sicily, Rome. And that's just the very first part of the campaign of Italy between Sicily, July 43, 1943, and the liberation of Rome, June 44. That's not even one year, it's 11 months, okay? So, give please um, an overview. It's all over the gray in between layers. Okay, so the only cases of recovers is when you see a rosette close to the name. You see those two cases there? You see the stars close to the name, to the last name? This means that these service members were eventually recovered in the most random circumstances in the decades after the war. Imagine that tomorrow we're able to go and find any other of them, American Battle Monuments Commission will get in touch with the family and ask exactly the same question of 76 years ago. Would you like the remains back in the United States or would you like him or her to be buried forever at the Sicily Rome? Okay. So the last detail of this beautiful facility and possibly my favorite one is the ceiling And we're going to try a little trick to show it all. Let me let you see. So you should be able now to see the whole ceiling. Okay. So you see the, the characters represented there. You have Oreo, you have the bull, you have the Gemini, and so on. Okay. So this is the concept behind. This ceiling is beautiful, not only finishing. This is a constellation representation with the planets, okay? And actually, if you go there and see the, the white circles, you have two of them and one is there on the Leo. So these two whites are planets and the red dots you see are stars, okay? So this means that this is a night sky where you see, where you raise your eyes and see the planets and the constellation. It's not a, a random sky at all. This is the sky how it was looking like two o'clock at two o'clock in the morning of January 22nd, 1944. So this is like having freezed forever the moment of the ancient ending. So all the beautiful people buried or memorialized here, if they raise their eyes, this is what they saw that night. So I'm going to try to switch off the lights and see if you're able to see the difference, okay? Bear with me. Can you see that? Beautiful. The stars and the planets? Beautiful. Yeah, indeed. Okay, so we're going to go back to the sunlight. You're lucky you have such a beautiful day. Oh yeah, it is. It's kind sort of summer day. Yes. And I want you to see the overview of the facility. I'm gonna be silent for a few seconds. We have two flags, US flags, of course, uh, every single day. We raise, we flow them, 
and then we take them down at five o'clock every day. So up over there, down over there actually, is where our walk started by the lake. We moved all the way up on the left alley and then we are here eventually at the memorial, okay? So I'm gonna be here and if you have any question, the tour has actually terminated here. This is how a tour terminates in real life, in real presence. If you were here today in presence, this is how we would terminate the tour. Thank you very much for joining and for being the, actually the very first virtual tour we had oh. in, um, for the general public. And I'm here for questions. Any questions you may have, please fire it off. Um, well, I want to thank you, first of all, for letting us have this wonderful tour and also thank the um, American Embassy for offering these virtual visits uh, because we're in Trieste and yep. uh, it's really hard for us to get down to Neturo. Yeah. And especially in these times, it's impossible. And having this possibility is fantastic. So thank you for this. And thank you for everything that you do in um, maintaining the memory of those people who lost their lives and served for the American um, Armed Forces. Yeah. Um, they, being a local, I'm even more proud. I'm proud already to be the, the, the guy, the storyteller of this beautiful facility. I am also a local, and that means a lot to me, that these beautiful people sacrificed their life for my future, basically, okay? And the future of my country. Mm -hmm. And thank you for maintaining the contact with those families, too. Oh, yeah, indeed. Um, so important in keeping their memories alive. So, I don't have any more questions. Do you have a question, Michael? No? Okay. Well, I, right. oh, I wanted so, to tell you that in Trieste, uh -huh. um, we were occupied by Allied forces um, uh, for nine years, yeah. from 1945 until 1954. Yeah. And we also had a great baseball teams. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. And we still have a baseball field here that's called Soldier's Field. And uh, the teams were the Giants, and they had all the American teams, and the children are still playing baseball here. That's we beautiful. Two fields, actually, so we're, we're keeping the memory alive, too. Yeah, we, we should, I mean, we don't have official, we, we know the local team, but we should organize a friendly match. You should, we should, we should. We we're gonna find a way. We're gonna when whenever norm, some normality is restored, we're gonna find a way. Okay. And that I think we beautiful. should come to Neturo, <laughs> definitely. Oh yeah. Okay. Yes. No problem. Well, we can have a rematch. All right, in Trieste. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Not on a windy day, by the way. <laughs> All right. No way. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, and, and, uh, uh, thank you also okay. for Eduardo Maracolza for being the cameraman. Eduardo is one of our interns. We have uh, constantly internship programs here and it's actually uh, very useful for them because they have a chance to practice English and it's very useful of course for us, for the big hand they give us. You want to say something Eduardo? Where are you from? What's your age? What you study? Uh, I don't know. I thank you so much for everybody for what I did. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna switch the camera. You're gonna be scared. Okay. Now you're not scared any longer because <laughs> and she, also uh, the very first few seconds may be scared for. Thank, okay. thank you to my pleasure. Uh, all right, Melanie Resto for helping organize this as well. The superintendent of the cemetery. Yeah, sure. All right. Take care, everyone. Okay. okay. You. Bye bye. Have a good day. Bye bye. 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 Okay. Uh, stop recording.